Jonathan, thank you for being here. Nick, thanks for having me. It's tough to cram all that stuff into an introduction. You've done, you've done a lot so far. Yes, but you know, you can always simplify it too. <laughs> yeah. Bottom line is, uh, we're glad you're here. So, so uh, I want to ask you, um, you know, for the most part, um, Helen mentioned that, that you grew up in a, in a family of uh, real estate people. What was it about the job site visits with your dad that spoke to you? And how old were you when that kind of, just when you decided that that was going to be something you were going to continue to do? It's hard to tell how, I, I probably started visiting jobs when I was seven or eight and began working in yeah. construction jobs when I was 13. And I loved the kind of action that all the men working together was all men in construction back then, the smell of the mud. There's a particular smell to construction mud and construction concrete. And, but I also uh, was deeply connected to, the, to nature and the environment and loved to, uh, and felt pain at what I saw as environmental destruction. And I also had a deep sense of social justice. And the other side of the story is that- As my, a kid, you, you yeah. were thinking these things. Yes, and yeah. so my mother, for example, was very active in civil rights at that time and yeah. working in inner city schools to teach kids to teach reading and stuff. And I, from the, so what's so lucky about my life is I have a calling. And when you have a calling, it gives a lot, uh, it gets a lot of responsibility, but it gives you a clarity of where to go. Mm -hmm. The problem was, that where I wanted to go didn't exist back then. There was no clear path for how you brought social right. justice, environment, and building together. Right, interesting. You know, and it's funny because we have this stereotype that we think about sort of New York-based uh, real estate right. developers, uh, especially these days, <laughs> as, uh, you know, deal-making, profit-driven, but, you know, you're, you're in an entirely different universe already by the time you were about eight. Um, <laughs> So when you got out of college, you went to work for your family business, and, uh, but, but you started being attracted to those kinds of projects that would, as you right. say, sort of unify those various interests that you had. Right, so I began working in the family business knowing, that, which is a very respectable apartment builder in New York City, and knowing that it was really, I need, there was a huge amount I needed to learn about the craft of how to be a developer, but in the back of my mind, always knowing that I had a different calling. But at the same time, I started working with a community. I was living in the lower edge of Soho and the Lower East Side, which in the 70s was pretty right. funky. Yeah. And I began working with a community group called the Educational Alliance, which had been a settlement house that had been in that community for over 100 years, helping them build housing for homeless people, uh, um, uh, parenting centers, co-op uh, nurseries, uh, drug treatment centers, uh, centers for uh, very low-income elderly. And so I began to understand how you finance, how you build, what are the issues of those populations, how do you... And there was a moment in my life when it became pretty clear to me that I wanted to bring those two streams together. Yeah. Were you already playing music at this point? So I started playing music... Uh, so when I was a little kid, I fell in love with the violin. I should back up. So when I was a little kid, um, my elementary school music teacher was very radical. It's in the early 50s, and Pete Seeger had been ostracized because he had, right. people thought he was a communist. Yeah. And so she hired him to come to our school to give him some work and teach world music. Not every day, he would come and do these special assemblies. So, you know, first of all, I had this amazing mentor in Pete Seeger, I mean, who we would hear yeah. do all this incredible stuff. And I began playing the violin and then I began playing guitar. And it, that story about the folk center was amazing to me because it, I then got very much into the whole New York folk scene and started playing at coffee houses and just hanging out and then grew a rock and roll band and, uh, and a country band. And so just music, playing music yeah. was always another part of it. Yeah. So you are definitely not your atypical real estate developer in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when did the uh, when did the environmental piece come into your your working once you're starting to develop those projects on the Lower East Side? When did that green building concept start coming into it? So I I knew I wanted to be green, and I knew that the, and there was like a hippie movement of green building, which is really really geodesic domes and some really interesting stuff. Uh, in, in that realm yeah. that was very hard to integrate into the, it was very urban, r rural, I'm sorry. The, the green movement was right. all Almost rural. The, just the post-commune thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, commune and then post-commune. Yeah. So it was very hard to, we had to figure out how to integrate it into urban buildings. Mm -hmm. um, 
I did my first building on my own in 1980. It was called the American Thread Building. It's a renovation of a building in Tribeca. And I reimagined how people were going to live and work. So it's the first building in the world that came with internet access. It was low speed internet access and a modem and computer in every apartment because we said we're going to, but anyway, I want to make that green. So I went to the lumber yard and I said, you know, most of the lumber comes from raping the rainforest. And like, how do we get lumber that's like from good sources? And they looked at me and said, you're nuts. We have no idea. The lumber comes from like the broker. We don't know where it comes from. And you know, I'd say paints, you know, they like, they, the smells, there's chemicals and stuff. How do we get like non-chemically paint? And they'd say, this is what we got, you know? So the, I had an aspiration, but there was no system mm -hmm. uh, in the in the early 80s and also in the early 90s. So I actually had to invent my own system for how you could figure out what made things greener or not. Mm -hmm. I was also working in a very, when I began working in affordable housing, there was no money for green. The first actually major building I did was in Denver. It was the renovation of the Denver Dry Goods Building, a fantastic... Uh, Fantastic department store in downtown. De downtown Denver was dead then, and there was the revitalization. I brought in the Rocky Mountain Institute to consult right. on making it green, and um, this is a $35 million project to start with, and there was a $1,200 bill for this green consulting, and the city rejected it. They said, this green stuff is like a fantasy. It's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with this building. You got to pay for that. That bill, you got to pay out of your own pocket. So I learned the discipline Amazing. of having to be green without having a penny more to spend. What that means is you have to go more passive. It means you have to use more insulation. You have to focus on smart systems. You actually have to focus on human behavior. Uh, things like not low VOC, non-chemical paints right. and stuff actually cost no more. It was an amazing uh, discipline for me to learn yeah. how to be green without the indulgence of money. Yeah. In case you just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town here with Jonathan Rose. Um, I should, should ask you about your book, The Well-Tempered City, because um, it includes a lot of what we're talking about, and it references your, your journey and much more. And of course, the reference in the title is, is a musical one. Right. So the idea, so let's back up. So Pythagoras, 2,500 years ago, observed- Really, we're gonna go back that far? So should we not? I can, I can go further. I can go. How about Bach? Let's start with Bach. Okay. So because of Pythagoras, music was tuned to specific keys, and the keys were, were not tuned in a way that you go from key to key to key. The idea of temperament, um, and Bach had this, was a deeply religious man and he had this fantastic vision that he was going to take what he understood to be the architecture of the universe, its extraordinary harmony, and bring it to earth in music and express it. But his tools were limited because of this yeah. tuning system. The idea of temperament figured out how you could retune instruments just a little bit, keys a little bit, so you go from key to key to key. And this exploded his capacities, expanded his capacities, and he wrote an amazing piece of music called The Well-Tempered Clavier, books one and two, that were an exposition on how to use this vast new range of, uh, of major and minor keys that were all open and integrated for all of a sudden. And um, when I was thinking about the issue of cities, th the issue is that too much of what we do is, so, is si in silos or is disintegrated. So we know that, for example, you need higher density to create walkable communities that can support mass transit and have more parks and open space. People think density and open space are in conflict, but actually sprawl is in conflict with open space, not density. So the, what I realized and what the book is about is this vast integration. And the vast integration's purpose is to create harmony mm -hmm. on Earth. And so what better analogy to use than the analogy that actually created the vast integration yeah. of music? Yeah. A harmonious musical system yeah. can also be applied towards a harmonious city. We don't have a ton of time. Uh, there's a. I want to mention a couple of little things. Tell us about um, a community garden and what that does in a neighborhood. So um, community gardens, uh, and by the way, interesting what community gardens do, they tended to rise out of very low-income neighborhoods and abandoned neighborhoods. So you see them in, in coming out of Detroit, right. for example, and then and, and the... Uh, you know, bed in Harlem when they were going through very bad times. So what they're doing, they're amazing places that, first of all, provide people with healthy, affordable food. They're places of community where people come together and work together and collaborate and share. They're very safe. People don't commit crimes in community gardens, and they're usually fenced in. So in these emerging, in these rough neighborhoods, they were places of sanctuary. Um, they also had, in, in New York, they had these little things called casitas, which came out of the Caribbean, where musicians would gather and hang out and also 
play poker and drink beer. And um, so they, they became community cultural health education centers. Yeah, and watching things grow, connecting yeah. to nature in some small way. Um, quick other question. If I think about a failed urban renewal project where a section of ghetto was torn down and these big towers were built, and then fast forward 40 years and these things are falling apart and they've now become, in fact, dangerous and uh, not healthy. How do you approach a project like that, thinking about how to change it? So the, the either you tear, so we've done both as our company, you either have to tear them down, and one of the key things when you tear down is no displacement. So you have to actually, Organize, you build a new piece, you tear a piece, you build a piece, you tear a piece, so that people are continually having a place to live and you're evolving it into a new state of mind. Or we did a, we just recently finished a project in um, East Harlem where we took uh, a parking lot in the area where the garbage was kept and all that stuff, moved that elsewhere, and then built a fantastic new green building. And because we really believe in mixes of uses and that uh, the institutions that bring pe that give people opportunity in life. There's an incredible charter school mm -hmm. called the Harlem Dream Academy. There, amazing uh, public space that is, serves as both the playground for the community, but also a place where seniors can hang out. And so it's a mixture of open space, green building, and yeah. education. And, and speaking of green building, in your book, you mention uh, a reference to. Uh, an example of what happened in Baltimore with uh, some police brutality, a guy, a guy named Freddie Gray. And uh, the case of Freddie Gray was, you know, more information there than I had known, which was that he grew up in one of these projects. So he actually grew up in just regular old slum housing owned by private owners. And when he was about 22 months old, he and his his sister were so overexposed to lead-based paint that they went into some kind of shock. Their, her mother took him to the hospital, and they, her mother, their mother was, by the way, a drug addict, and their blood level was tested, and it was many, many times higher than the, the appropriate level. And what we now know from, from many of the assaults is, by the way, there's toxic stress, there's environmental stress, there's a lead poisoning, is that in the young developing minds, it destroys them. Mm -hmm. And so Freddie Gray and his sister never had a chance. They're, they, from then on, had attention deficit disorder. They could not pay attention in school. They could not learn. Their cognitive capacity was undermined. So by the time he was arrested by the police and thrown in the van and uh, killed, uh, in that consequence, um, there'd been a long history of dysfunction, which was never his fault. So your projects, in fact, are addressing that kind right. of social ill as well by right. trying to clean up the environment where people in need, right. subsidized housing, people, low-income people, right. don't have to be exposed to toxins. Right. So yeah. one of the things we do as a company is we build amazing models of what new green integrated housing can be, but we also... Uh, or have a much larger activity to buy existing affordable housing around the country, make it green according to something called the Enterprise Green Community Guidelines, and also bring health, social, educational services to the residents. Yeah. There's so much here that's, that's interesting and relevant, yeah. and especially now. Um, the last part of your book I just want to touch on before we wrap up, Jonathan, is you talk about compassion. Tell us, tell us why that is a key element to this, this whole concept. So first, where do we want to go? So the ideal state to me is when humans and nature are living in harmony and when uh, every child has equal opportunity to thrive. So there's these two goals, this human goal, this human nature goal. So how do we get there? And if you really look at society, what we need is to recognize that we are all in this together. That what Darwin's evolution was not about the survival of the fittest as the one who could beat the other one up, but the pieces that fit together the most. We have to move from a state of mind of me to we. And the best tools for that are the ones of altruism and of greater compassion. And those tools are available to human beings. We are signaling selfishness in our culture, and we have to shift to signal compassion. The architect Christopher Alexander said, making wholeness heals the maker. And so by doing that, it heals us too. Yeah. What about the opportunity for us to make those kinds of changes in the face of obstacles like systems, EPA is losing its funding, um, environmental justice is gonna be a program that's gonna be eliminated apparently in, in the new federal budget. These challenges that you know, not all of us have the resources you do, how do you suggest that we can embrace this kind of concept of 
togetherness, aspirational thinking, and so, make a difference. So what we find is when you move to optimize a system rather than maximize it, which is what nature does, when you move to integrate, it actually saves money. It's actually more cost effective. We know, for example, that when we uh, heal people in their homes versus healing them in hospital emergency rooms, it costs a fifth. So there, the the compassionate altruistic integrative solution actually is all is not only better for society, better for Earth, but it's actually better for our economics too. So what each one of us can do is can begin to model that, to model how how do we take compassion for the other and and appreciation for the wholeness of nature. Community gardens was a fantastic example. Those people didn't have money, but they modeled something amazing. Yeah. Each one of us can be a, 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 a can model a new world. Yeah. All right. Well, we will try. Yeah. I will try. We'll try. We're all Meanwhile, try. Jonathan, thank you and congratulations on the success of your book and your projects. And you know, it sounds like there are very there are very few people who are really uh, bringing this combination of awareness and skill set and capability to the marketplace in the way you are. So congratulations on that as well. All right. Jonathan Rose, Jonathan Rose Companies, author of the book, The Well-Tempered City.